I want to get you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 27 and 28 to you. Colossians 1, 27. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Ladies, we have this great privilege of proclaiming Christ in our teaching And in this instruction, we're going to think more about why we do that and how we do that. Uh, Let me just pray for us as we begin and ask the Lord to help us. Father God, we praise you for Calvary. We praise you for the grace that we know because of what the Lord Jesus did for us on the cross And we ask for your help as we seek to understand in this instruction how to faithfully connect our teaching to the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, be our help, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let's review what we've covered so far in the workshop. Um, So far we've heard instructions on the conviction of text and framework. We started the day off yesterday with that. The principle that goes with that is this, we must let the Bible shape our frameworks rather than let our, letting our frameworks shape our interpretation of the Bible. We had a talk on structure. Every text has a structure. The structure will reveal an emphasis and the emphasis must shape our message. We had an instruction on context. We must understand the context in order to see how the original audience understood the text. Later today, we're going to have one more instruction on melodic line. And Joanna's going to teach us about looking for a, a bigger, um, a bigger overarching theme of each book of the Bible. Now, yesterday, I drew a, many lovely pictures for you, but today, I have a little bit of an improvement. You're going to be so impressed. Take a look at this, huh? Wow, much better, right? (laughs) This is the pathway for preparation. We keep kind of coming back to this. Um, I just want to sort of remind you where we are on the pathway. Uh, The conviction of text and framework isn't written on here, but that's something we deal with before the Lord, before we come to the text, okay? And and then we've got our study of the text on the left there. The context, structure, and melodic line are part of our exegesis. We're trying to understand what did the original author mean for that first audience. In this talk, in this instruction, we're taking a turn, and we're going across the top of the pathway, and we're beginning some theological reflection. We're going to try to connect that first argument to Christ. So that's where we are on the pathway. I just wanted to show you that. I'll keep that up there for you if you want to refer to it. I want to tell you a story about something that happened in my workplace. You heard yesterday that I work as a nurse, and... Um, God has given me lots of gospel opportunities at work, which I'm so thankful for. But several months ago, a colleague of mine and I were doing just kind of a simple task that put us side by side in a small room. We didn't really have to think a lot. Um, I love these settings because they prove to be great conversation opportunities. You know, it's like when you ride in the car with someone and they're kind of stuck with you. And so you can really take advantage of it. Well, on this particular day, she was the one to initiate the conversation. And she knows I like to talk about the Bible. And here's what she asked me. She said, Joanne, what is the most important thing you would want me to know from the Bible? I was like, wow. This is the question, the kind of question I pray for that I ask the Lord to bring uh, into my life. 
It's, I was so thankful that she asked that question. What is the most important thing you would want your friend to know from the Bible? Take a minute and think about that. What would you have said to my friend? Or what would you say to your friend if they asked you that? What do you think Jesus would say as an answer to that question? In this session, we're going to consider what Jesus did say. So turn in your Bibles to Luke 24. And I want to remind you of the context of what I'm about to read to you. Luke 24. Just a few days before the Lord Jesus had been crucified on a cross and his body was placed in a tomb. And on the third day, some of the women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb and found the tomb empty. And they encountered angels who told them that Jesus had risen, just as he said. Well, they run and go tell the disciples this good news, and they don't believe them. Uh, Except for Peter, who runs to go see for himself. Later that day, two of the followers of Jesus were walking along the road and talking about all that had transpired in the last three days. Listen as I read, beginning in verse 15 of Luke chapter 24. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad, Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let me ask a few questions from these verses to see what we can learn about how Jesus understands the scriptures. Keep your Bibles open to that page in Luke 24, and let's consider how Jesus reads his Bible. What does he say that the scriptures are about? Just tell me out loud, anybody. What does he say they're about? him. They're about himself. Okay, so I'm going to write, uh-oh, I'm going to write JC here. They're about Jesus Christ. And he reads it in light of himself, right? He says in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now skip ahead to verses 44 through 48, Later in the text, Jesus appears to the disciples, and he speaks to them in these verses. Let me read those for us. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, 
beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. Is there anything else uh, we learn from those verses or any confirmation from those verses? What do you notice? Does he ex- ex- yes, tell me. Fantastic. Yeah, so he's saying that the law of Moses, so what does that include, the law of Moses? The Pentateuch, right where we're studying this, this workshop. What else does he say is about him? The Psalms. Okay, anything else? The prophets. So really, all of their scriptures. He's saying the whole of the Old Testament is about him. Um, so the Old Testament, I'm going to put that over here on this side, the Old Testament anticipates and predicts Jesus. How does he refer to himself and what happened to him? Look at those verses again. Is there anything in particular that the Old Testament points to about Christ? Tell me a verse that you can connect that to. What in particular? Just shout out if you have an answer. I think I heard somebody say suffering. Is that right? What verse do you see that in? 46. Okay. Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Good. What about in 26? Can we back that up a little bit? Also in 26, Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. So Jesus is highlighting that we are to especially note that Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. What are the sufferings of Christ? Where is the pinnacle of his suffering seen? At the cross. Good. Okay, so I'm going to erase that, and we're going to instead put a cross there. And this little, um, okay, that's all I'm going to do so far. (laughs) And his glory. What about his glory? Where do we see Christ's glory after the cross? The resurrection. Okay, so that's our little symbol for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament anticipates and predicts the suffering and glory of Jesus. Okay, last question to consider on this. Is it only the Old Testament that points to the death and resurrection of Jesus? Is there anything else or anyone else in this passage in Luke 24 that points to the death and resurrection of Jesus? It's a little bit more, a little trickier question here. What does he say to the disciples in 47 and 48? They're going to be his witnesses. Good. That's the role that they're going to play. They're going to be the witnesses who carry this message of what they've seen and heard, with the heart of that message being the suffering and subsequent glory of Christ. And they did that, right? Where do we see that written down? Acts? Great. Keep going. Where else? Uh, The epistles. Good. We're in one of the Gospels, but the other Gospels also, right? So really, it's the whole of the New Testament is also about Christ. So I'm going to put the New Testament over here. The New Testament looks back at the cross. It reflects on and applies the death and resurrection of Jesus. So our conviction from the Bible and from what Jesus taught in Luke 24 is this. The death and resurrection of Christ is the unifying interpretive center of scriptures according to the scriptures. The death and resurrection of Christ is the unifying interpretive center of the scriptures 
according to the scriptures. That's our conviction. Okay, so that's our belief. We've, we've been convinced of that from looking at Luke 24. And now, I'll keep these both up here so you can see them. The principle that goes with that is this. If we are to teach the Bible as Christians, we must show a legitimate connection from our text to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are to teach the Bible as Christians, we must show a legitimate connection from our text to the gospel of Jesus Christ every single time. Every time. Now, I just want to take a second and be clear. We use the word gospel to describe the narrative accounts of Christ's life found in the first four books of the New Testament, the synoptic gospels. But instead, in this instruction, we are talking about the gospel. The message of the Bible that tells us how a holy God has made a way for sinful man to live at peace with him through the substitutionary death of Christ on our behalf and his resurrection from the dead if we would repent of our sin and trust in Christ Jesus. It's important to be clear on the gospel as we work our way through this instruction. Well, these verses in Luke that we've looked at have helped us to answer the why question Why do we need to connect every passage to the gospel of Christ? It's our conviction now. And as we prepare to teach, depending on which testament we're studying, we're going to ask different questions. So I'm going to refer back to this picture. We want to know, how does my passage connect to the death and resurrection of Jesus? So is it an Old Testament passage that's anticipating and predicting the gospel? Or am I in a New Testament passage that's reflecting on and applying the gospel? So for us in this workshop on Exodus, we are anticipating and predicting the gospel, right? Well, as you grow in your conviction about connecting your passage to the gospel, you're convinced it should be part of your teaching, you might be tempted towards a couple of things. Um, One would be that You have the message of the gospel in your mind, and you know it should be there every time, so you just sort of tack it on the end of every single teaching you do. And it kind of comes out of nowhere, and it feels a little awkward, but you're so committed to including it, and so you're faithful. You're not sure how it connects, but you know it should be there. That's the point of that one. The other thing is that it might always sound the same. And so your audience, if they sit under your teaching week after week after week, might be like, okay, here comes the gospel, and I know exactly what she's going to say. So it's not very unique to the passage. Um, Have you ever had the opportunity to sit under really good teaching where a woman is maybe leading a Bible study or faithfully working her way through a book of the Bible week after week, and you think, okay, I wonder how she's going to connect to the gospel in this passage because I really don't see it. And then she does. And you see it too, and your heart is so encouraged. And then she does it again the next week, but in a different way. She kind of comes at it from a different angle. It's a different connection. And you rejoice again in the good news of the gospel. That's what we want to do, sisters, as Bible teachers. We want to grow in doing that too. We want to make progress in making these legitimate connections to the gospel. We also need to consider the second part of question four on your worksheet. You may have even kind of breezed over it. But if you notice on your worksheet, there's the second half of that question that says, what aspect or part of the gospel is in view? So they're asking you to be really specific about that text. What aspect of the gospel is in view? Another way that you might say that is what aspect of the fullness of the person and work of Christ is in view? So one thing that might help you with that is a second drawing. You know we love our drawings, right? All right, here we go. This one's not quite as polished. Can you see that okay? All right. What is at the core or center of this drawing? The death and resurrection of Jesus, that 
important gospel message. So the death and resurrection are still the interpretive center of the scriptures in the second drawing. But then we have an outer circle that includes some aspects of the gospel, or you might call them angles, that expand its scope a little. <clears throat> in the drawing, you'll see that these are the incarnation, Christ's teachings and miracles, his ascension, and his second coming. Like facets on a diamond, these aspects reflect the center and make it shine more brightly. Then on the side, you'll see too that we have some effects or implications of the gospel. On the outer edges, <clears throat> these are things like belief and repentance, forgiveness and obedience all connected to the case that Jesus made in Luke 24. So all these categories or aspects of the person and work of Christ help us to make legitimate connections to the gospel. They don't replace the message of the death and resurrection of Christ, but they give us a doorway, an entry point to connect to the gospel. So as we approach this point in our preparation, which is question four on your worksheet, we have to ask, what aspect of the gospel is in view in our passage? And how is the author, the original author, making a connection to the gospel by highlighting one of these aspects? Any questions so far? Yes, tell me. Yeah, those might be things that you encounter more in New Testament passages um, when you're teaching about um, imperatives connected to the gospel. Um, but those are effects or implications of the gospel. So in Luke 24, Jesus tells them, um, you are my witnesses. Or he says in verse 47, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. So that might be part of what you feel is being highlighted in the text that you're teaching, and it would connect you to the cross. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. We'll keep going. Um, we want to make these legitimate connections from our passage to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happens if we don't? What happens if we don't connect our passage to the gospel? What are some pitfalls or dangers for us as teachers? Tell me, tell me some that might come to your mind. We're going to teach moralism. That's, that's really significant. We teach a works-based righteousness. Um, let me write these up here for you. Moralism. It's burdensome for our audience, right? So uh, it communicates that we don't have a need for a savior and it leaves our audience full of guilt because no one can measure up perfectly, right? Anything else you think of that we would miss that would be a big pitfall for us? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. So it becomes just like a, motivational, or a nice story. Good. Any others? Yeah, Joy. Great. Okay, it can be um, egocentric. Yeah, tell me. You missed the whole point of why the passage is there? Is that what you said? Yeah, good. Especially because we know after looking at Luke 24 that Jesus says it's there because it's about him. What's a big one um, with our non-Christian friends? What do we miss? Sorry, a little bit louder. We point them to nothing. We miss evangelism. 
we miss the chance to tell them about the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Another thing that we might miss, particularly in the Old Testament, well, not particularly, because we could see it from both Testaments, um, we miss the encouragement of seeing the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So how can we learn to do these things uh, legitimately from our passages as we teach? Or to put it another way and use a word that you're becoming more familiar with, What strategies might we use to help us make legitimate gospel connections? I want to focus on three. And I'm going to make it, I know if you're like me, you need things to, um, I'll start with the same letter, so I've done that for you. Okay, so three T's. Three T's. Particularly helpful in Old Testament narrative. The first one is themes. Biblical themes. Biblical themes are repeated, uh, a repeated theme that has several Bible-based data points with a similar relationship from one to the next, progressing through the scriptures until we see these met fully in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? The Bible's one big story broken up into 66 books, but it has an, a historical unfolding And it progressively reveals the redemption that we have in Christ. So we want to keep our eye out for themes. The Bible sets us up in a way that by the time we get to Christ, we're like, oh, this is the one who was promised, right? What are some examples of biblical themes? Anything you think of even from Exodus, but anywhere. The tabernacle. What would be another word we might use for that? That's more generic. Dwelling place? Yeah, because that would cover a lot of different data points in Scripture, right? So good. Tabernacle. Or dwelling. Excellent. Another one in maybe something you've noticed so far in your study of Exodus. Yeah, Joy. Covenant is a great one. That's come up a lot already, hasn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I always got to remember to look left. Tell me. Judgment. That's come up already, hasn't it? Judgment. Progressively unfolding throughout the pages of Scripture. Anything else? Oh, so many hands. Sharon. The law. Okay. Tell me, Beatrice. Beatrice. Promised land, okay. Jerry? Redemption. Oh, man, you guys are on a roll now. Um, let me see if there are a few others on my list that I want to add. Um, exile. Marriage. Did somebody say marriage? Yeah, good. Oh, I'm running out of room. Priesthood, sacrifice, that goes with that, yes. Sacrifice for sin, such an important one. Uh, Sonship, that's from beginning to end in the Bible. You guys, you got it. King and kingdom. Okay. So in order to know biblical themes... You really have to know your Bible, don't you? And it just takes time. So don't get discouraged with that. Just keep reading your Bible and ask the Lord, Lord, help me see these themes. Help me see where they pop up. Uh, That's our first T, themes. Okay. Let me... Okay. Our second T is text. And what I want you to think about with this one is Old Testament allusions or quotes that are found in the New Testament. So if you're studying the Old Testament, you're going to look, does anyone in the New Testament reference my passage 
or preach about it or allude to it. And if you're studying the New Testament, you're going to say, is there anything in my text that originated from a passage in the Old Testament? So you can use this in your study of either testament. The Bible authors are actually interpreting the scriptures for us. So they're doing us a big favor there. So if you were in, or one question you would want to ask is, how is the New Testament author reflecting on or applying the gospel when he references that Old Testament passage? Or how has Christ fulfilled this passage? You can use cross-references as a means of learning with this. Now, not every Old Testament allusion is a gospel connection, but it might be, so take a look at it. You might decide to set it aside if it doesn't seem to be helpful. Let's consider an example from Exodus. In Exodus 1, we saw the Lord preserving his people Israel, even though the sons were under a terrible death sentence, right? And we know that that led to Exodus 2, where the Lord miraculously protected and raised up a son, Moses, who would lead in rescuing them out of Egypt. He would be the son who leads in delivering the people. You may have talked about this in your small groups yesterday, but that passage is alluded to in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. It said, turn to it, let's turn to it together. Matthew 2, we're going to start reading in verse... Uh, 13. This is after Jesus has been born. Matthew 2, starting in verse 13, says this. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, and that's the prophet Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. This connects to the similar story of Moses in Exodus 2. Out of Egypt I called my son. And this repeated word son, you may have noticed even in your study of Exodus 1, points us to the true son, the Lord Jesus, who was protected from a death sentence of his day and was raised up to be the deliverer of God's people. Do you see the connections? If you were teaching on Exodus 1 and 2, and you had to say, what aspect of the gospel is in view? How can I get to the cross through this story? You might come in through the incarnation, the fact that God was born, was born as an infant, and the Lord protected him through a similar death sentence for his purposes of having him die on the cross in our place. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Okay. So that's that entry point or the aspect that might allow you to talk about Jesus. So, so far we've covered themes and text, and now we have one more, and this is called type or typology. You can say either word. Typology is a kind of comparison of two objects. They're either similar or dissimilar. It could be a person, a place, an event, or an institution in Israel's history that find their fulfillment or culmination in Christ. Do you want me to say that again? Okay. A person, place, object. I didn't say that before, but I'm adding it now. Event or institution in Israel's history that find its fulfillment or culmination in Christ. It's a lesser thing anticipating a greater thing. The greater thing is Christ. So it's a comparison. This idea, this word type, is actually a Bible word. And it's mentioned in Romans 5, 
verses 12 through 14, where Paul argues that Adam is an Old Testament type that helps us understand Christ. The sin of Adam and its effects help us understand the work of Christ and its effects. Can you think of an example from Exodus that might be of an event in Exodus that might be a type, an event, an object, a person? There are so many. Speak loudly. The Passover. Great. Anything in particular about the Passover? The Passover lamb. Who does that point to? Christ. Christ. Amen. Moses. Okay, why do you say Moses? I think you're right, but... (laughs) Yeah, he was a deliverer, a rescuer. Was he perfect? He was not, but he points us to Christ, doesn't he? Yeah. What about the... The event of Exodus. What is Exodus about in the first part? A little bit louder? Yeah, that's right. Their, um, their redemption from slavery. Their rescue. That's so good. You guys have so many good ones. Um, so keep these three stat- strategies in mind that begin with T. Text, type, and theme. I hope that helps you like... Put some, get some handles on it. Um, turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to work a little Old Testament narrative exercise together. 1 Samuel 17. This is a very familiar story of Israel up against the Philistine army. I want you to take a minute and skim 1 through 58. I know that's a lot of verses, but I want you to skim 1 through 58. You know this story. But here's what I want you to look for while you skim. Consider how is David a type of Christ? So look for things in that. I'm going to give you a few minutes of silence to do that. How is David a type of Christ? 1 Samuel 17 1 through 58. Okay, I'm going to pull us back together. And let me know some things that that stood out to you. You might have several different data points there, but what did you notice? How is David a comparison to Christ? So speak loudly. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that king role um, in light of a failed king. Yeah. Somebody else, what did you notice? Yes, tell me from the back. Amen. That's right. Um, offers himself. You guys are killing it. Okay, keep going. Tell me a few more. Yes. Yeah, good. That's right. He's um, opposed by those closest to him. His brothers. Tell me another one. Shepherd. I love it. Yes. Kind of an unlikely hero in that respect. Yes, that's right. He um, fights the enemy. He teaches about God. Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah, so he points them to hope in the Lord through this battle. Good. He fights in the name of God. Yes, tell me. Uh-huh. 
Okay, great. Okay, this is hilarious. <laughs> I love it. I, I don't often get to teach while monkeys run across the roof. I love it so much. Um, okay, we digress. So a couple of others I had, um, we mentioned Shepherd, unlikely hero in verse 15, concerned by taunts of the enemy in verse 26, opposed by closest to him, determined to fight for God's people. We've kind of got that there. He's confident that God will deliver him. He fights in the name of God. And in verse 47, he fights so that all may know the God of Israel. Can you see how David is a type of Christ? Yeah, it takes some work, right? It takes some work to dig and find those things. Um, So any New Testament passages come to mind that might that you might think would be a connection to David's battle with Goliath being similar to Jesus' battle with Satan? Yes, the temptation. That's right. That's right. He was taunted by the enemy in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Any other texts come to mind? I looked at 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. Just flip there real quick. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, 54 through 57 says this. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. I just want to uh, reflect on these three T's and say sometimes you might feel like your strategies overlap a little bit. Uh, So just keep that in mind. And I also want to add one other note just as a bonus that um, as we read the Old Testament, we should remember not to draw a quick line from the heroes and kings uh, and the main characters of the story to ourselves, right? Uh, while there may be things in their character that we could be warned of or that we could imitate as good, we are not kings. We're not major leaders of a people group. We are more similar to the Israelites. And I think that's really helpful to remember. We are the people of God who need a savior. We need to be rescued from bondage. We've been ransomed by the Lord for him. So this is often referred to as the ordinary Israelite principle. So just keep that in mind. In the story of David and Goliath, we're most similar to the people who are cowering over in the corner. There's nothing grand or victorious about us. All right, just remember, these strategies are meant to serve you. And like all strategies that we present to you, if you feel like one is not working... Set it aside and try another one. And if you feel like one is working, check yourself by trying another one. Does that make sense? All right. Um, Yes, tell me, Naomi. If I were teaching this text, I would, I would mention a lot of these actually as entryways to the cross. I want to talk about the death and resurrection of Christ every time. I hope that's clear that in those entryways, we're not just highlighting the entryway, but it's a, a means that helps us get to the cross. So if I'm going to teach about the incarnation, um, if I see, if I think the incarnation of Christ is really highlighted here, or if I'm teaching about the Passover lamb, 
And I'm, I mean, well, that's an easy one, right? <laughs> um, that takes us straight to the, the lamb whose blood was slain for us. Uh, if I'm teaching about the, incar- if I think my passage really seems to highlight the incarnation, I'm going to talk about the incarnation, but I want it to point to the cross. Because it's not a message of salvation for my audience if all I talk about is that God became man. Does that make sense? So if I were teaching about David and I say, notice that he's a king, he's acting as a a king in place of the, the failed king. Notice that he's opposed by those close to him. Notice that he's a shepherd, an unlikely hero. You know, I might highlight those things about David, and then when I connect to Jesus, I might say, friends, David points us ahead to Christ. Look at all these ways Christ was similar. And here's where he, it was on the cross where he defeated the greatest enemy. Does that make sense, kind of how that might fit together? You're like, oh, you know, so your audience would be like, oh, wow, I really see it. Okay, we need to finish up, but I want to say another theme you might notice in the book of Ruth. What's a big theme in the book of Ruth? Redeemer, it's a repeated word. So if you were looking for a gospel connection there, you might say the Redeemer Boaz is a type that points us to Christ, our perfect Redeemer. And you could talk about what it means to redeem someone and point to New Testament texts that would reinforce how we have been bought with a price. Okay? Um, If there are several gospel connections in your passage and you're trying to think, which one do I really, like, focus on? You might want to consider question number three and see which one fits best with question number three. And that might help you kind of narrow things down a little bit. Consider the author's main point in the whole passage and ask which one fits best. Friends, it's our great privilege to share the gospel in our teaching, and we want to grow in being better uh, at that. I want to grow in doing that well. So let me restate the principle for us in this instruction. If we are to teach the Bible as Christians... We must show a legitimate connection from our text to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me pray and thank the Lord for this time. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful that you sent your son Jesus to die the death that we deserved and that you raised him from the dead and that he has made a way for us to be reconciled to you, the holy Lord God. Lord, we thank you that your Bible is one big story and that so much of the Old Testament points to Christ and so much of the New Testament uh, reflects on and applies the cross. Lord, help us to do that better. Grow us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.